This is the Iowa City City Council Economic Development Committee meeting for October 27th, 2021. Um, I think all the council members are present, John Thomas, Mazir Salee, and Susan Mims, myself. We'll start there, Rachel, and go around and get introductions. It helps Wendy with the minutes. Eric Gore, City Attorney. I'm Wendy Ford, Economic Development Coordinator. Go. go ahead, Kurt. Okay. Uh, Kurt Nelson, uh, PDC Entrepreneurial Development Center. Jill Wilkins, New Boco. Start right back. Uh, Mike Heaton, New Boco. You guys want to introduce yourselves? I'm Redmond Jones, Deputy City Manager. Right Andrew. Oh, Andrew Sherburn, uh, Executive Director of Film Scene. John Shikadan, Executive Director at Bangler. John Kenyon, Executive Director of the City of Literature. Adam Knight, Producing Artistic Director at Riverside Theater. Aaron Stonerunk, Development Director at Riverside Theater. And I'm Matt Smart, I'm a playwright uh, that's opening up the new theater. Okay. And our city manager. Jeff Ruin, city manager. Well, welcome everybody. Uh, thanks for being here. And I think we've got um, our usual annual exciting uh, allocations to hopefully approve and uh, great work that you're all doing in the community. So. Uh, second on the agenda is to consider approval of minutes from the December 9th, 2020 Economic Development Committee meeting. It's been a while. Yeah. <laughs> I noticed a, that earlier. I said, almost oh, a year. Do, do yeah. Yeah. Said I'll, we have a motion? I'll move that. Second. Okay. Any discussion on the minutes? All those in favor say aye. 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 Were, you, were you an aye, Moz? Yeah. Okay. Three to zero passes the minutes. Thank you. Um, item number three, consider a fiscal year 23 budget recommendation uh, to the full city council community development for community development assistance for Entrefest. So Wendy, I'll let you take it away. Uh, okay, sounds good. Rather than go through the memos that I included in the packet, hopefully you've had a chance to at least scan those, I thought I would give the time to the representatives from each organization to talk about why they're here, what's gonna happen this coming year, maybe what happened in the last couple of years or so, um, and let them have the floor. So our, our first is Jill Wilkins. Jill? Great. Thank you for having me. Uh, here with uh, Nubo Co, we are a non 501c3 nonprofit based out of Cedar Rapids, uh, which focuses on entrepreneurship, innovation, and tech education, and also the producer of Entrefest. And we're really excited because Entrefest, we are planning to bring back to the city of Iowa City uh, this coming June, 2022. Um, for those who uh, may or may not have been part of previous years when Entrefest was around, um, and actually, if you'd like to go ahead and advance, Wendy, thank you. Sure. Um, I'll give a very short background because I know we're short on time, but we are a two-day conference that focuses on uh, those main areas of the organization, which is the entrepreneurship, innovation, tech education. And uh, the goal is really to bring uh, our business leaders within that sphere to the area for really high quality content and connections. Um, if you don't mind advancing, that would be great. As I mentioned, we're looking at June 9th and 10th here in Iowa City in the Ped Mall area. If you'd please advance, that would be great. Uh, just wanted to note that we have already had, and it's great to see, have actually so many uh, partners here that we are excited to be able to uh, connect with already or reach out and to connect with so far. So uh, the current venues are ones that we have been in touch with already and what we are really looking at as far as uh, kind of core locations to be able to hold Entrefest film scene is, is, is one of those locations. and. We were able to tour the new, new facility and it's beautiful, so congrats. Um, if you'd like to advance, um, just wanted to give you a little bit of information here on, on who is coming. So this gives you just a general um, idea of the number of speakers that we are bringing into the community, both um, locally, regionally, and nationally um, for, for the event, kind of a breakdown. Um, and, and attendance, you know, attendance is, is an interesting factor for events right now. Uh, Pre-COVID numbers, we are uh, averaging over those years um, in the in the mid 400s. Uh, I, I went ahead and shared with you our, our kind of our COVID event numbers, but certainly um, with a few things uh, we have in place, we're um, certainly hoping that 22 allows us to get back to um, some of our, our, our pre-COVID numbers and to be able to open up and just allow um, many more ticket sales than we were able to last year year. Um, if you're able to advance, that'd be great. Um, again, just in case you aren't familiar with the event, uh, this is definitely a collaboration of both 
Quat content and connections. So we're really excited to be able to utilize different partners in the community for different meetup spaces, for those one-on-ones, for those sessions. But it's really important for us to bring the conference into the community. Um, that's what makes it unique for the event itself is what the attendees like. But also we're wanting to be able to make sure that we are supporting uh, the local businesses that make um, the, the space unique. And so, you know, food and beverage, we want to have that be within the, the restaurants that are there and to make sure that the dollars that we are spending are utilized with local resources. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, just giving you a real quick highlight here on some of the types of attendees that you would see. Certainly everything from students to early stage entrepreneurs to those who are looking to maybe exit or scale up a business. You're looking at ecosystem builders, uh, business leaders within uh, maybe more traditional business settings that are looking to, to innovate or take some of those unique principles that an entrepreneur might use. Um, and then just really looking to continue to grow that economy within Iowa. So the unique thing about our event is that it is very Iowa focused and we wanna celebrate um, the great things that we have going on here. Next slide would be great, thanks. And then just um, sharing a few pictures again in case you aren't familiar with the event um, to showcase, you know, we have improv workshops to, to um, help with that, just that presentation and thinking on your toes and just sharing some of the, the um, feedback we've received. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and again, as well, please. Uh, and just also wanted to let you know that this is also very much a collaborative effort. And so we have uh, two teams that work with us. We have a planning team and a team that we also utilize to really focus on DE&I efforts. So we actually, this will be the third year that we actually have this group really focusing on expanding our reach with the event. Um, many of our planning team members are uh, members of organizations within the Iowa City community, but also within Quad Cities, Cedar Falls, Des Moines, just again, really collectively um, utilizing minds of, of great members throughout the state to be able to make sure that we're creating content and opportunities that really are meaningful and impactful for our attendees. And also to, to continue to expand our reach to bring more people here. Um, that is something that we've been able to see over the, actually like the last year in particular, of um, being able to bring more people in from outside the communities to be able to actually highlight what is happening in Iowa. And that has um, really led to a boost in some um, unique experiences and attendees as well. Uh, next slide, please. Just um, showing some additional reaches. Uh, uh, next slide, please. And then um, again, just highlighting. I won't go through the, the, the ending slides are some of the sponsorship information that you already have. And so um, I will leave it at there, but definitely happy to answer any questions, um, but definitely excited to be back and to be able to utilize the Ped Mall that's, um, you know, the, the construction projects and being able to see that, you know, it's a beautiful space. And so um, really looking forward to the opportunity to work with everyone again. And I'm sorry that I neglected to say that um, Jill and Nuboko are requesting $10,000 from the FY23 Thank budget you. and would, would uh, request that for um, your recommendation to the full city council. Thank you, Wendy. <clears throat> Thank you. Questions, comments from? I just had a little one noticed. I noticed in one of the slides that the, the word agilist. Yes. What, what is that? Yes, um, good question. <laughs> so we actually um, have previously held um, our organization at Agile Conference. That is um, it's gonna, basically a methodology is the best way of um, to describe it, this many mostly used by software developers, or at least started with self software developers, and it is basically creating a process of working within short iterations and continually going back to your customer to understand and along the process getting that feedback, as opposed to completing the project and then you get the feedback and then you take like ten steps back. You're consistently doing that. It's also um, a mindset of, be of creating this safe, open space to be able to continue to have this feedback. So we. Um, have held this conference um, in the past. We're seeing an opportunity to maybe fold that into EntreFest. Uh, one, it's a great opportunity to con continue to build the event um, and, and draw additional attendees, but also the principle is really something that entrepreneurs, innovators, software developers can definitely use. And so we can see value in both those audiences and bringing those together. Thanks. You're welcome. Anything else? Well, I know it's been years since I went to it. I don't remember the, the last time we had the full uh, one downtown, but it was just lots of great events and information and energy. 
So it's nice to see us hopefully coming out of uh, the pandemic or at least figuring out a way to live with it and yeah. still be able to, you know, get together in person and share that kind of energy and interaction. So, uh, and, and I think this, as it said in the documents, I mean, this event really puts Iowa City on the, the state and the national stage. I mean, in terms of the people that you invite in and the connections that you make, um, and those things are just, you know, vitally important as we try and continue to make this city and this area really well known. And so it's great to have it back downtown in Iowa City. So I will definitely be supporting this. Um, you saying you'll have it, when the last time you have it in Iowa City? It would have been 2017. This is the first time I heard of it, even though I live here since 2012. But I don't know if I'm very involved in the community, and this is the first time for me to hear about it. That means a lot of people who look like me, they don't know about it. How do you advertise this so everybody can enjoy it? Yeah. Yeah, no, that's a great question. You know, we have certainly um, partners within the community, within the, you know, ICAD um, business partnership, downtown district. So we have tapped into quite a few of our, you know, business community partners. Um, but we are uh, looking at, you know, just what are those expansive expansion opportunities to be able to talk about messaging, talking about where we talk, you know, where we are distributing that information. And so we have um, a couple meetings set. Um, with some connections from the business partnership, but that is, a, you know, that is, continues to be a main focus of the, the, the group that is working on the DE&I committee. And that has been a challenge from time to time. And so I, I, I fully acknowledge that that is an area for us to grow and that we've been really working on the last couple of years. And I do think we've seen a lot of success since we started to implement that back in uh, our 2019 event. Uh, then going into COVID, you know, that's certainly, change things when we change to virtual and how we were marketing, but it's definitely a continued effort as far as continuing to look at partner organizations that be, we can be tapping into to help uh, make introductions, to expand um, the, the channels in which we're using to be able to draw a more broad audience. Did you remember, you have any memory for 2017, what actual like happening during those days, like programs or anything? What types of programs we uh -huh. had? Sure, yeah, back in 2017, gosh, um, a wide variety. So we, um, throughout the day, we will have uh, breakout sessions that would be workshops. So some of that would be marketing focused, sales focused. Some of it could be HR related or accounting. So definitely, um, you know, related to running your business, especially if you're maybe are an early stage startup. Innovation programming could be some, for example, the agile that I was talking about, thinking about how to use different mindsets within your team to think about approaches differently. And so during the day, we would have many of those breakout sessions. We would have different keynotes. The last time we were here, um, one of our keynotes was the founder of Warby Parker, the online eyeglasses, um, website company at the time. And then with that, we did some additional programming and parties. So we utilized a lot of the downtown bars for say like different meetups for people to just interact and connect. We had um, a muralist outside on the Ped Mall. So people could kind of watch, create the mural. Uh, we had a small band out on the, um, oh, the little, by the, the, by the fountain, the little stage area, um, kind of by the graduate. So we tried to do, a, a, and still continue to try to do a mix of opportunities where you're sitting in more of like an educational learning session or a workshop versus uh, trying to connect just with other attendees. Um, because we have found certainly that many of the opportunities and maybe even the most value is the people who meet each other, who then are able to find either future business opportunities, um, potential partnerships, or even just you know colleagues to collaborate with. And this is like, you just said like, I, it look, because I really don't know yeah. I want to picture this so yeah. I can understand what's sure. going on. Um, you were saying like this is kind of like a workshop for most of the people who benefit out of this is most likely business. Yes. And um, it, it, it can be like kind of workshop for how to deal in certain topic in your business, which yep. is will help those business owner or is this like for existing business or could be like somebody who 
want to open a business or? Uh, it could be for both, and we do have both. Um, so the, certainly those that are maybe working within a small business or maybe a company that are just looking for new ideas. Mm -hmm. And you know, some of that's that learning some new things or just that rejuvenation of being around others. Mm -hmm. um, but then there's definitely a large group that are students are people who maybe have an idea that are wanting to start the business, but aren't quite sure totally of the approaches to take or wanting to learn more. Or someone who is maybe going through maybe venture school or an accelerator program. So an early stage company where they have the idea, they have the business plan, but they're looking to learn more tools to be able to advance their business quicker. I think this is really good, but, you know, but I really would like to see since uh, even after like the 17 points that we have for Black Lives mm -hmm. Matter, we one of them is really encouraging like buyback community mm -hmm. to open businesses to improve their businesses, and yeah. I think uh, I really would like to see those people are being engaging, mm -hmm. and it is uh, to me if I don't know about it, a lot of people that they have business and look like me, they don't know about it. So I just hope that you will do like a good job of reaching out to people, like maybe advertise this with like organization that serve those kind of uh, people, or maybe like just reach out to buy back community who own businesses, even though if it's small businesses, yep. how can they come and benefit out of this? Yep. I, I really like to see something like that happening. Yep. yep. I, I, that is a high priority for us, and I, I, I totally agree. Um, definitely appreciate the partnerships that we have in town, and would definitely love to, especially just not living in Cedar Rapids, if there are other opportunities or groups that anyone has recommendations for good connections to be able to make sure we're, we're talking to groups that can help us spread that word, I would, I would love to have that conversation. I think Thank it's you. pretty impressive that you've, you know, added kind of, a, you've got your planning committee, but you have a separate DE&I committee mm -hmm. to really put some focus on that and the fact that 30% of your presenters are going to be people of color, mm -hmm. um, I think is also impressive. I think one of the things I've seen with this, and it, this is not meant as a criticism, it's just everybody's at a different stage when you yeah. start talking about businesses and one, their experience and their knowledge and the kind of business they're looking at. And when I attended this back in 2017, I certainly got the impression that, that the focus of this particular event is much more on people who've already gotten started mm -hmm. a bit in some way. Mm -hmm. They may already have some connections in the entrepreneurial space. Um, maybe a lot of it was kind of tech oriented, not necessarily all of it. So I think, I think it's important when we think about, you know, in the city as, you know, in sponsoring this and think about other opportunities that no one event or program can possibly meet all of the different needs that we have in the community based on the kinds of experience people have, the kind of business they might want to open. Like, like I would not see this necessarily as beneficial for somebody who's wanting to start a small retail store. Maybe I'm wrong, okay? But I just, I see the focus of it kind of differently. And so um, I'm glad to see the DE&I emphasis. I'm glad to see the number of people of color. But for anyone, person of color or white, whatever, who's looking at, this isn't necessarily gonna be the right fit for everybody, but we need to make sure that it's available and open to everyone and everyone is aware of it, so. I feel yeah, there. I would say that uh, since I was around when Entrepreneurs first started with, up with you and I, right? Um, the 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 focus all all across time has been more to the small business side than the large business side. Mm -hmm. So I would say that you know you know when I started to watch, I, as I've spoken at a lot of them, and uh, when I started to watch, who was coming at the very beginning, and they were held around the state before this group started to take them over here in the corridor, and uh, it was very little interstate commerce. It was an awful lot of of retail, hospitality, um, small businesses, uh, Main Street businesses, that type of thing. And then, and, the, and the programming was focused that way. So mm -hmm. I, and now what they've done with the program is they've expanded the programming, but they haven't taken that piece of the program okay. now. So I would say that it would fit what you thought okay. maybe it wouldn't. Okay. There are tracks with this, I think, and from your perspective, this is a much larger thing than maybe you're, you're, you're thinking, but there are multiple tracks going on at multiple times. There are a lot of people, right? So it's like a big convention. 
in setting. It's not like mm -hmm. come and you're going to meet in three rooms. It's a lot of space with a lot of speakers speaking at the same time. So if you have a business, you can pick the tracks that Speak fit your line. business versus yes. you have a business, you pick the tracks that fit your business. Um, so it's a lot of information in a couple of days and you can tailor it to the business that comes. Mm -hmm. okay. Thanks. I, I think that's great. why exactly we need more people to attend it because there is many opportunities here yes. not, uh, not for different business and as you said, many workshops in the same day, you just pick what you like to attend. And I'm glad that you have a black uh, leader to present, but that doesn't mean you're going to have black people if you don't invite them. And I think black person present to white people is not like black leader present to white lead, uh, uh, black people because it will be, they will see that person powerful and they will say, okay, if he can do it, we can do it. Yep. So I, I, I think it will be good opportunity since you have black present and to invite also, mm -hmm. you know, people of color to come and see how those people become successful and they present even to help other people to be successful in their businesses. Yeah, I just yeah. let us help you spread out the word when you, the time come. Yeah. Any further comments? Can we get a motion to approve the funding recommendation? So moved. Okay. Um, all those in favor say aye. 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 Okay. Passes 3-0. Congratulations. Look forward to it. Thank It'll you very fun. much for your support. Yeah, like thanks for coming. Well, thank you for all the you. work. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And we may be able to help you with those connections into Oops. various other parts of our community that uh, Maz was referring to. So. That if there's an opportunity to follow up and, and discuss more, I'd love to. Yeah, definitely. That'd be great. Thank you for okay. offering that. Thanks. Yes. Yeah. Yep. I'll, I'll maybe connect with you for that. Okay, Jill, sounds okay, good. Great. Thank you so much for All your right. time. Thanks, Jill. It. Appreciate it. All right, moving on to uh, item number four. Consider fiscal year 23 budget recommendation to the full city council community development assistance for the Entrepreneurial Development Center. And we have Kurt Nelson here with us today. And the only thing I'll point out is that um, we have been assisting the EDC um, with funding since 2015 and then since 2016 with $25,000 per year. So Kurt, if you'd like to have the floor. Uh, well, first off, I'll just say thank you very much for all your support uh, on a regular basis. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's very much needed. Um, I've provided you with a couple of things uh, at your table, um, this piece we draft up just for the city of Iowa City versus this full, full brochure, which gets done at the end of every year because we work statewide, right? And so this is statewide stats. This is Iowa City stats. Um, so you can kind of get a sense for it. I'll probably speak mostly to the Iowa City piece um, as we go through it. Um, you know, we are an organization that was founded in 2003, so we're entering our 19th year. Um, we are very focused on helping scale interstate commerce businesses that are home office in Iowa. So they're the kind of businesses that bring people and money from other states and other countries here. So they're the, you know, they're the businesses that really build financial vitality in, in your community around which strong retail and, and hospitality can be built. Um, so we've stayed very razor focused on that. Uh, we work with startup entrepreneurs, we work with early stage uh, businesses, and we work with 80 year old businesses. I was most of the day today in Washington, Iowa with Bazooka Farmstar. It's about a 35 now million dollar uh, manure management agricultural manufacturing company. Um, we engaged with them when they were less than 10 million and and the reason they're now in the 30 some million is because of a lot of the work that we did with them, right? And that's growing for that county, for that city, for that area. That's growing jobs and, and, uh, and money and everything else for that area. So that's the kind of work we do. I know that people say, oh, EDC, oh, you guys work with startups. And I say, well, yes, but only about a third of our resources go to startups and the rest of it goes to early stage or later stage businesses all around the state. To date, we've worked with a little over 1,200 businesses. Um, if you're counting it all, right around 34% are, uh, of all those businesses are in the underserved classification, right? If you, so if, you know, because we do track that because some people ask that question. Um, yeah, I think that, uh, you know, over 18 years, if you look at the businesses and we, we try and track the growth of the businesses and get the economic development stats from them over time, we don't get them from nearly all of them, but if you look at the stats in the, in the larger brochure, I mean, 
those these businesses we've helped raise almost well, 767 million dollars worth of worth of investment capital they've grown over 2.3 billion dollars in revenue um, they have net created over 3,000 jobs average wages are now above over $62,000 um, across the state increased payroll by over 670 million across the companies that we've tracked so that's about you know 3.7 billion dollars worth of state impact um, it's kind of about as large as it gets for any program in the country um, that we track I think over time this is a not-for-profit 501c6 organization um, so we have to raise the capital for this organization and or generate it ourselves every year it's about 900 and some thousand dollars to do what we do um, so we've generated you know just shy of 15 million dollars over 18 years to run it um, uh, 52 percent of that funding comes from private supporters um, which are corporations people like Alliant Energy and, and all the different businesses There's about a hundred and a hundred and some of them and you can see them all you can see everyone that supports this organization because all the logos are all across are all across the smaller the logo the smaller the amount of money right <laughs> but but you're way over on the large logo side right and you can kind of see who else is who else is over there with you um, 20 percent comes from our own operational earnings so when we go to work for a company like bazooka that's a profitable company so we don't use your money we don't use money to help people that are making money right we charge them so there are so a piece of what we do we we, we we charge for so that we aren't we aren't out having to raise all of our dollars right um, in this way 28% uh, comes from some form of public support of which you are in that bucket uh, over time so um, and if you look at comparing if you look at if, if 3.7 billion dollars of impact has been created or more because we can't find some of the people you know, some people don't give us numbers that's about 250 dollars to one in return from a return standpoint you guys you know invest in us for for Iowa City uh, specifically and so I'll kind of try and focus on on that um, I can highlight a few businesses for you uh, viewpoint molecular I've been working with them um, and, and they're highlighted as a case study in the front of the piece I gave you but I've been working with them for about six years and uh, this is a this is a pharmaceutical product it's radionuclear medicine um, it's uh, in, in detail it's uh, alpha particle therapy for heart to treat cancers the very first two phase one clinical trials are in underway now for metastatic melanoma at Mayo and neuroendocrine tumors at the University of Iowa. This is blockbuster drug technology. If this goes well, if it goes, if it goes on the street like it went in the lab, it will be revolutionary, life changing uh, in the cancer space and for this community. Um, if you look, last year we raised. Um, we helped them raise uh, $13 million in a Series A financing, and raising $13 in a Series A financing in the United States in 2020 was a real trick. Right? But, but nonetheless, the markets were still strong. We got that done. They got another $5 million in SBIR, so $8 million, $18 million in the company last year. And they're now hiring. Um, and they've hired 10 people already with six-figure incomes. They moved into Iowa City from the BioVentures Center, so you now have them in your town and they're creating, they're going to create another in the next six months, another eight six-figure income jobs. So this is, and they're bringing people from around the country. These are high-tech high, high tech science and medicine people that they're bringing to your community, um, which is going to be, I think, excellent for you. Um, I think ultimately uh, this business, you know, we've, we've invested about 1,100 hours in this business so far, um, and it's one that uh, I think really has an opportunity to put this community on the map uh, as it goes forward um, it'll take about I think another hundred million dollars of capital um, to get this company far enough, far enough along in the FDA clinical trials processes to, to decide if there's going to be a partner whether it's going to be a Merck or a Pfizer or Novartis or somebody like that but but this is a big deal uh, it's been a long time uh, it's been since I think 1992 the university had a professor that had a uh, it was called a CMV promoter it was an actual uh, pharmaceutical product but it was actually used in labs and it generated for the university about 160 million dollars this product just the metastatic melanoma product if itself is a four billion dollar a year product just the one and if it hits it, they're going to have a product for multiple cancers just kind of give you a sense of the scope of this business so it was a big deal um, for your area. I think, uh, and I can just, I'll go to another one that's, that's nice and small and you might know about it. Do you know the Keto Kitchen up here on Washington? I guess okay. I know about it. Mo Nazaradin's business. Yes, now, yeah, so. Mo, I'm Fatima. I know Mo, no Mo for a long time. Mo's a friend of my son's, if, yeah. I, if I go way back. 
Um, and, uh, but, but, and Mo's a consummate entrepreneur. Um, uh, he, he always has at least three things going. Um, but we've been engaged to help him now with this business. And at the same time, we've teed up uh, Riley and Michael Ian and Lynch from Pear Deck, which I'll chat with in just a minute. But remember, they had that large exit last year I talked to you about and sold their business for an astronomical amount of money. Um, and they're now going to help him raise the money to scale that business. And that business really is going to is going to focus on meal prep in the keto space. You know, so for people who really want to eat in a, in a more healthy manner or lose a lot of weight, whichever you want to pick, they'll, they'll do both. Right. But 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 that's going to get grown here, funded here. And the idea with that business is to scale that across the country. So that's why Michael and Riley are interested in it. And, and we teed them up to it. Um, so I think you'll see that uh, I think you'll see that business kind of go from kind of small to a much larger over the next couple of years. Um, and, uh, and, and, and if you get a chance, go buy something from him. Yeah. <laughs> Because he could, the man, the young man, you know, he needs the support from that perspective. Um, a, a special note, right, on on Michael and Riley. Do you, how many of you know them? Do you know them, right? You know, so you know that that exit, uh, and, I, and I said this to you last year, but that exit's going to bring to Johnson County, then and and uh, over a, a couple more ex exit pieces in the, uh, with the parent company that bought them, right around a hundred million dollars, between all the investors and the founders and everyone. And if you look at Michael and Riley, there are two people who are going to spend that money in your community. They are not the kind of entrepreneurs that buy big houses and fancy cars and, and summer homes and lake homes. They are, they are going to live exactly the way they've been living. Right now, I think they're engaged in affordable housing. They've already started a foundation. They've already got on the board of one of your private schools. I think Michael bought a building and put them in it and gave them a reduced rent just so they could survive. So these folks, you're going to see far more than you fund us come from them every quarter of every year back to this community. And that's going to be huge for you all. So I'd invite you to chat with them from time to time. I mm -hmm. think they are kind of salt of the earth folks um, who are very, very interested in making this an ideal community to live in. Okay. So they're very concerned about carbon footprint, sustainability, every, you name it. They are into it if it's in that area. So, and they will spend their money on it. Um, so that's, but that's what you get when you get a business that can grow like that. And if you have a chat with them, they'll tell you how much, you know, I've over, I think 1,200 hours in that business, how much we helped that you helped us help them with, right? But that's this, look what you get back, right? It's pretty phenomenal. Um, so, um, if you look at the back page, I, I, I provide you stats on a regular basis. Um, you know, so if I look at 2020, uh, capital raised and deployed in your area was $20 million. Now, when I reported it in 2019, it was $2 million. So it was up $18 million in 2020. The public-private split is about 70% 70, 70 private, 30% public. And, that, and the only reason that public number was so high is because of all those uh, SBIR grants that, that uh, Viewpoint got. Increased revenue by the clients that we worked with in Iowa City was $37.4 million in 2020. That was only 11 in, in 19. Um, new jobs created in 2020 was 97, only 31 the prior year. Average wage was 73,000 in 2020. Um, it was 63 the prior year. And an increased payroll was 4.4 4 million. It was only 2.6. So 2020 was a really significant year for, for Iowa City for these businesses that, that we were helping. Um, the overall economic impact for 2020 was 61.7 million. It was only 15.8 the year before. So this is great return against your annual uh, investment in us. And I think you, I think you kind of understand that you know, if we're, if we're coming up with $950,000 a year. I mean, you represent a very, a very important small piece of, of what we get, <laughs> right? Um, you know, when it came to the pandemic, and, and, and mostly for us up there, the derecho and, and, and all of the impact, if you look across, across this last 18 months, you know, we, we coordinate really well with ICAD down here. We opened our doors uh, to a little bit more in the retail sector that we normally don't do uh, during, the, during the pandemic just to be of help when we could be of help. Um, we put out a, a, a how many, I don't know how many of you got on our whole news, daily newsletter chain, but we were kind of the mouthpiece for everything that was going on around, 
around the pandemic and around the derecho show, and that went that went every day for the better part of nine months um, for everybody. Um, we're really busy. Business is strong for our clients. Um, you know, it's our ninth year. There's five of us. We're very focused on what we do. So, thanks for all your generosity. If you got questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Thanks, Kurt. Questions? Can you get a motion to approve the twenty-five thousand dollars to the Entrepreneurial Development Center? I'll move. Second. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Okay. Passes three zero to make that recommendation. Thank you, Kurt. Appreciate it. Thanks for coming, Kurt. Have a great day. Okay. Item number five, consider fiscal year 23 budget recommendation to the full city council for community development, development assistance funding for arts organizations, Angler Theater and Mission Creek, Film Scene, City of Literature, Riverside Theater. Please pull your chairs up, join us. I don't know in what order you want to go through these. Yeah, let's do Angler Theater first, so. Here we are. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, I'll just start off by, again, thanking you guys for consideration uh, in the budget. You've been a great support over the years. Obviously, the last 18 months was uh, pretty critical for us as we were closed during the entire pandemic, um, which completely decimated our uh, earned revenue uh, opportunities. However, during that same time, we continued to act on our mission and support arts and culture here in Iowa City. We were able to uh, create two full digital um, festivals and also support over 200 local artists to make sure that the art scene continued to thrive after the pandemic waned. Um, those digital festivals, um, as well as our first film, Ghost Creek, uh, gave us national recognition on a scale that we hadn't seen before and increased our awareness um, across the country. So we're really excited about the opportunities as we move into the new year about what we might expect for um, our festivals and our general programming. Um, one other thing that we're really proud of is we had a collaboration with the city and the downtown district um, this fall to have Mission Creek summer sessions, which um, activated different parts of the city to bring in audiences that may not feel comfortable coming to the theater um, and really uh, drove into our DEI efforts and make sure that there was representation and that um, different parts of the community were invited to partake in free programming. Um, so we were really proud of that. Um, as we move forward, obviously, Andre Perry, our long-term executive director, has uh, taken a step back and taken a different role. So that's why I'm here today. Um, he was also our lead programmer for the theater. And as we move into this new phase, there's going to be more opportunity for programming in our space and also with our community partners than we've seen in the past. We're currently projecting a 40% increase in programming in the next year, which is pretty dramatic, but we're really excited about that. Um, so we anticipate that that will bring a larger economic impact to downtown Iowa City. Um, it will also allow us to focus more on DEI efforts that we've already um, prioritized um, in a new way. So. We're really excited about that opportunity. Um, one of the things that I've already talked about, Mission Creek, um, also will see a large jump in the next year. The expenses associated with that festival are anticipated to increase 30 to 45, 30 to 40 percent um, from the 2019 levels, making it one of the largest festivals that we've ever put on. So we're really diving back in um, head first to make sure that the community has an opportunity to come out and enjoy uh, music and literature for this beloved event. Um, so all that to say, uh, it's been a tough 18 months, but we are excited for the future. We're ready to welcome patrons back into our space. And uh, work has already begun on our festival. So we're really happy to be presenting positive news for the theater. Um, and thank you for consideration um, for this budget, INED. It was interesting. I was downtown the other night, and there was a long line outside the door. Yeah. I think it was Trey Kennedy was, yeah. Yeah, was performing, and it was like, there are a lot of people waiting to get in, so that was really, really nice to see. So yeah. I was glad, glad the doors are opening back up. 
questions or comments from? Yeah, I would, a personal story, you know, it has been a long time since I've been in the Engler, and uh, the first time back was the Esteban mm. performance, uh, yeah. uh, which, you know, was just, there are so many layers to that event. John, John Rapson was my neighbor, you know, and just a vital part of our community here, and, and the performance was extraordinary. Uh, so have sort of a welcome back, you know, the, the importance of that space to the city, to the community, you know, was just, it's a very powerful experience. Thank you. Yeah, I heard that was fantastic. Yeah, we, we were really happy to be able to partner with them to bring that uh, to fruition. I really think you guys are doing a good job. I like theater and film scene and everything, but also same thing. You still need to engage with the community more. I want to see people like from other community come to the downtown and enjoy all this. And uh, maybe sometime, I, I remember, uh, especially film scene, they used to give like discounted ticket for like a uh, number of the organizations so they can make their member attend and all this kind of things. Uh, yes, that will uh, like at least to bring people, like make them familiar with what in the downtown area. And we, we have, yes, certain people come to the downtown. I know some community that even is scared to come to the downtown at nighttime and all this. How can we make things exciting for them so they can come? Or how can we reach out to them and explain what these good programs is and how they can be engaged, yeah. Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. This is an area that we are fully aware of and is a priority for us. We've done um, surveying of our customer base and also reached out to populations that may not be served adequately today to see how we can step in and provide resources and make sure that people are getting access to the arts in this community. We do provide over a thousand free tickets to events um, for um, individuals that are involved with local nonprofits throughout the year through our LIFT program. So we're really proud of that. Uh, you mentioned that some people um, don't necessarily feel safe or comfortable coming to the downtown core. Um, and that is something that we have found in our studies. Um, that's why we're really trying to program outside of our space more and make sure that um, we're meeting people where they are in the community so that there's more opportunities to engage with art um, in a way that's comfortable for them. So it's definitely something that's on our minds. Um, we're not perfect today. We know that there's work to do, but it's definitely something that we're interested in continuing that effort. Yeah, I, I really like that, what you do, and definitely, but I, I want all other people to like, just enjoy uh, all, the, all the good work that you've been doing. And also like ideas about why I don't bring like cultural things for the, like look like the community on those and invite them. And if somebody like, if I know that there is in film scenes, there is a movie that about, like in different language or about certain thing, why not? You mm -hmm. know, just like advertise that maybe that will bring people mm -hmm. to come and watch that movie and just make them engage. As soon as you come to one thing and you find out this is amazing, you're gonna, after that, gonna be following and seeing like what coming next mm -hmm. and uh, who we can invite and all those kind of things, yeah. Yeah, I will say one other thing. We're looking at diversity in as a multifaceted, um, you know, thing that we need to increase, which it is. Um, financial diversity, we're definitely trying to find options for people to experience the arts that may not financially be able to. Um, we're also looking at um, providing interpretation, ASL interpretation for many of our events um, for people that may not be able to experience art. Um, so this is something that is definitely on our mind, um, like I said, and we just really want to continue to drive into that. And also, you know, I, I was thinking because I was talking to somebody else before, how can we, for example, the English theater, how can we use that space sometime to invite somebody, even if you invite some like speaker who really talk about certain things for certain communities so we can invite them to come, they can buy the ticket still, but you know, they, they will do it because mm -hmm. they want to listen to that speaker. Yeah. I would love to give you some ideas. When yeah, I'd love <laughs> to chat with you. Like <laughs> this, of course. But you know, you guys are doing great. Yeah, I'm going to be supporting this, definitely. <laughs> yeah, the, the idea of expanding venues 
I mean, I know that you know I live on the north side, and the the creation of that um, outdoor space on Lynn Street has become, in a sense, another cultural venue. Um, so yeah, trying to kind of create a, a network of such places, which I think in the end reinforce one another um, in that they bring people out um, in different settings, which, which can have their own strengths and possibilities. So yeah, it would be inter interesting to think about that. But I mean, just immediately for me, that, that's been a huge benefit uh, to those of us who live there as well as other people in the community. It's a, a very nice setting. So trying to identify where that could happen <laughs> or the potential of various commercial areas, for example, like, like that as a, as a way, kind of in a way replicating, you know, the Ped Mall as a cultural commercial setting. Uh, I think it's kind of an interesting thing to explore. Yeah, definitely. Thank you, John. We'll move on to uh, film scene and Refocus Film Festival. Welcome, Andrew. Hey, thanks. Thanks for having all of us here today, as always. Um, I guess I, I start off saying, you know, I love the fact that, that we sit down here right after we talk about entrepreneurship and, and building, um, you know, the local economy, because you talk about those people that are being recruited and retained in this community. Yes, it's about good jobs, but really it's about making this a vibrant place to live and raise a family, right? And, and I think that's, that's why we're all here today, right? Because the arts do that. Um, and, uh, you know, Livability Magazine just had their list of most livable cities in Iowa. City, again, was the number one most livable city in, in Iowa. And uh, I don't think that's by accident. That's because we invest in arts and culture in this community. Um, so film scene last year, I mean, you know, I think we're all going to give you a very similar story. The, uh, the pandemic was not kind to the arts. Um, you know, we are in the business of bringing people together for communal experiences. Um, that's what we do. Um, that's how we, that's how we enrich this community. So last year was tough. Um, well, last year and this year <laughs> have been tough. Uh, but, uh, you know, thanks to the support of, uh, of the city and, and the state and the federal government, uh, as well as all of, uh, Iowa city really, uh, you know, we're still here here and we still see a bright future. Um, you know, in this packet, I listed, um, you know, you can see our attendance and our membership from the last two years. Our attendance, as you might have noticed, went down quite a bit <laughs> when we were closed for more than a year. Um, but our membership stayed strong. And I think to me that embodies the, the kind of support that we have and, and the relationships we have with our community. We pivoted during the pandemic to offering uh, virtual screenings um, for free to our members and, and to many members of the, of the public. Um, you know, we, we took, uh, we made an effort to make sure that those, those films were diverse uh, to, to what Maza has been, been talking about here. Um, and, and really, I think that, that membership uh, sustainability is, is reflects that we were still active um, in that time. Um, and not just not just active, really, but um, we tried to stay busy. Uh, we renovated our original Ped Mall location. Uh, hopefully, you all have had a chance to set set foot back in in that space. Uh, it still feels like uh, it always you know it always has. There's that element of, of what it's always felt like in there. But now we have much more comfortable seating. <laughs> um, we have some uh, improved technology and just gave the the space an overall facelift and, and really made it a much more welcoming uh, environment. So we're excited about that. We've only been open over there for four weeks, but uh, it's great to have people back in that space and activate that part of the Ped Mall. Uh, I know we'll hear more about that in a second, but uh the other big thing that we did, uh, working with Iowa City Parks and Recs to launch Film Scene in the Park, um, that's been a terrific, I mean, that was just for our own morale at Film Scene to be able to put on a public performance again, but obviously the, the city, the community responded as well. We've had over 3,500 community members at those shows. Uh, we still have one left on Friday, uh, our big Halloween bash, Hocus Pocus. Uh, I know the city's planning some, some fun and games with that one. Uh, so there'll be even more people served there. That's on average uh, about 200 people um, per 
per screening that we had in the park this year. Um, and it was terrific. You know, we saw people that, uh, that we haven't seen ever before inside our space. So they got a chance to get to know us. We got a chance to get to know them. Uh, it was really terrific. We showed films in, in Chinese and French and Italian uh, out there and, you know, made sure, you know, we partnered uh, with Juneteenth and Iowa City Pride. Um, so there was a lot of, uh, there was diverse programming in that space. Uh, and it was all free, um, thanks to, really thanks to the city's support. Uh, and then the last thing that uh, that I wanted to point out that that we were up to during our closure was uh, you know taking the time I think as many of us have uh, to take stock of of what what we do um, since we weren't showing movies you know five times a day uh, we had a, a little bit of extra time to think about our role um, and so we've been embarking on new strategic planning initiatives um, to make sure that we really are making good on those um, those diversity and equity um, and justice uh, commitments that are that our, uh, that our organization has made. Um, so enhancing and expanding on some of the programs uh, that already exist at Film Scene, like Real Representation, uh, which spotlights uh, underrepresented perspective of female and non-binary artists on screen. Uh, our African Diaspora Committee, which uh, works to support films from the African, African American, and black filmmaking diaspora. Um, and then since we reopened, we actually have made it uh, a firm commitment that we will have open captioned screenings every week. Uh, in our spaces, so uh, open captions, like closed captions at home, but you can't turn them off, so they're open. Um, but that means that uh, our deaf and hard of hearing community can come to our space every single week and know that there's a film that they can watch uh, on screen, uh, and what we found is, even though we did that primarily in response to, to hearing from that sp specific community, it's benefited a lot of um, English as a second language patrons who have a much uh, you know more enjoyable time at the movies when they can read the words on screen. Uh, it's helped some other folks who, you know. Those Welsh accents are hard to follow sometimes, too. So uh, there's been a lot of uh, benefits to having that open, open caption um, program. Uh, and we're, we're really glad that, uh, that that's you know, been well received. Um, and then you know, just continuing those, uh, you know, what we've always been committed to, but formalizing a new community partnership program so that we can deepen those, um, those collaborations with uh, other community groups. So, we're always working, um, uh, I think, as, as Maza uh, alluded to, with community groups to, to connect uh, with other members of the community and organizations. Uh, but we wanted to make it easier for them to come to us and make a request um, for a partnership, because it is uh, expensive uh, to put a film on. We have to get film rights and reserve space and staff it, et cetera. Uh, but we want it to be affordable and accessible for those community organizations that, that bring passion and bring enthusiasm, even if they don't bring deep pockets. So that program uh, has been overhauled, and we're going to unveil that next year, uh, which should just make it easier, hopefully, um, for us to structure those partnerships. So try to stay busy, uh, even when we weren't showing movies at a, at a breakneck pace. Uh, but we are now open seven days a week at both locations again for the first time in 18 months, which means that's 5,500 screenings every year. Uh, all of them personally introduced by our staff because that's part of the, the touch point that's, uh, that we'd like to have to make sure that we're connecting with community. So we're back, uh, and that makes us happy, and uh, you know, glad that, uh, that we have your support. Thank you again for, for your support for many years, and, and hopefully you'll continue to, to support us. Oh, and I, I, I guess I should mention there's this thing about a film festival in here. Um, we, uh, you know, a few years ago when we presented to council uh, and introduced this notion of, uh, of the Refocus Film Festival, it was pre-pandemic, of course, and we were excited to get that off the ground. That has been delayed for a few years. We're hoping that we're able to launch that festival, uh, a festival that is true to Iowa City, authentically Iowa City, rooted in literature, a film festival that's about the adaptation of works to the screen. Um, we're hopeful that we can launch that uh, in the fall of next year. Um, that's our intention. But uh, I think one thing that we've learned over the last few months is not to uh, not to make commitments too far in advance. So we're going to take a little bit of time to make sure that next year we want to launch it in the right way, right? We want to make sure it's a vibrant experience for everybody. So we intend to do that, and we've appreciated the commitment uh, to support that first year whenever it happens. And hopefully, you'll continue to do that. Thanks. Questions, comments. Well, I, I mean, I'm impressed with how, I mean, I know how difficult it has been, you know, the last year and a half, um, but it did provide, as you were describing, some opportunities sort of 
gave an opportunity to kind of step back, uh, build, you know, build the organization on a certain level with, you know, the support that you were seeing, despite the fact that this, the screens weren't on. Um, the value of outdoor space, boy, that that's something that really came through for me with COVID was, I, I hadn't realized how, I mean, I've always loved in terms of cultural events being outdoors, but, you know, we were sort of forced to explore that and expand on it in a way that, you know, Lynn Street Plaza, I think, is a great example. That never would have happened, in my opinion, without having been forced to explore, you know, what are the opportunities? How can we increase or compensate for the loss of business indoors by moving it just outside and creating that space? Um, so, yeah, I really appreciate all the thought you've put into your you know, your work, um, expanding it, revising it. Sounds like it's been very productive. Thanks. Kind of ditto what John said. I was thinking yeah. the same things. It's just that, not that you wanted to be closed, not that any of you wanted to be, but the time that it did afford all of you to really do some deep analysis and planning for the future, um, hopefully makes all of the organizations that much better and stronger uh, once we get fully out of this. So it's great. Well, we'll move on to Riverside Theater. Adam and crew. Thanks, Andrew. Hey, folks. It's really nice to be in an actual room with you again this year. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. uh, Riverside is alive and well and moving forward after 40 years. Um, I think that uh, maybe um, I would just say that in Riverside's case, we didn't really close. We kept going this whole year. Um, maybe we were crazy. <laughs> maybe we should have stayed shuttered. Um, but uh, I think that Riverside, around the time that the pandemic really um, became clear, uh, had a choice to make. And the choice that we decided to follow was one of mission delivery, one in which we decided that the best thing we can do for our community, our community of, of patrons and our community of artists is to keep going, to keep telling serious-minded stories. And I think maybe as important um, to keep putting, um, giving employment opportunities to local artists. Um, that, because of that, I think that Riverside is still here. Um, in some ways, I think we're stronger than we were when we sat down two years ago. Um, to request continued funding from the city. Um, last year, we had seven full productions. Um, these weren't just Zoom readings. These were full sets, fully designed, um, fully rehearsed productions, often rehearsed in rooms like this with masks and then filmed with the actors um, unmasked, but everyone else masked. I think one actor said it was kind of like being in an operating, <laughs> getting operated on. It was very strange. Um, but those productions were incredibly well received. We had um, 8,734 patrons buy tickets to those shows. That's comparable to the amount of patrons who would come to a normal season at Gilbert Street. Um, as an example of that, uh, this um, April, we presented Sonnets for an Old Century by Jose Rivera. Um, that was an anthology play with a series of monologues similar to Spoon River Anthology featuring 23 actors. Um, that production, in part because of this playwright over here, who Matt sent it to Jose um, and said, I just saw this production of your play. I think you really like it. Jose watched it. He sent us a great note. Um, somehow Isaac Hamlet got word of that at the Press Citizen. Isaac contacted Jose and did an interview with him. And this is an, uh, an Academy Award nominated writer, Obie Award winning playwright, who um, gave a story in the Press Citizen lauding um, the work at Riverside Theater. Um, in addition to that, um, as John mentioned, thank God for outdoor spaces. And, and because of the city partnership over the last 20 years, Riverside has had the festival stage in Lower City Park. We weren't able to use that last year because of um, actors' equity regulations having to do with COVID protocols, but this year we were. And um, we made the decision not to do just one free Shakespeare play, but to do two. Um, so that there wouldn't be a net loss of that kind of free programming for the community. Um, we did 15 performances in July and August, 4,389 um, folks from the community attended, um, all free. 
and um, looking um, out at the audience, it was incredibly inspiring to um, gather again, to have that kind of live storytelling event again. And um, what it told me is that people are hungry to do this again, to do it safely, and to um, continue to do this thing that we love. Um, we are currently partnering with the Iowa City Book Festival and UNESCO City of Literature on Grand Inquisitor at the um, University of Iowa um, Library. Um, moving forward, we're incredibly excited about our new home in the Ped Mall. Um, that's possible because of the folks in this room and the Greater City Council really um, making sure that this um, development and that Tailwinds Group um, uh, checked all those boxes and provided a meaningful cultural space for, for our city. Um, that was a lifeline for us. Um, it's a new state-of-the-art 150-seat black box theater. Um, it's going to have a has loop system we just um, uh, determined today. Um, ADA friendly not only for patrons but also for artists, which is something that um, the Gilbert Street uh, simply could not provide. Um, we're going to be moving over the next three years from 100 nights of programming to 150 nights of programming a year. Um, most of that's because of the increased opportunities that the lobby space will provide. Um, opportunities like doing new play workshops, cabaret performances, opera on tap, um, improv events. That's going to add lanes to our programming that we couldn't do previously. It's going to add um, things like um, you know, welcoming more people into our space, um, increasing what it means not only to be a Riverside patron, but, but to be a Riverside artist. Um, that's uh, you know, in no small part because of, of the TIF funding and what the city has provided. Um, we are seeking um, continued funding. Um, as you'll see from our budget uh, line on page, uh, page four and five, strangely enough, um, Riverside has had a few good years these last few years. Um, that's been because of that, uh, because we've been smart, we've been resilient, and we've been um, really trying to streamline costs as much as possible, and in no small part because we left our Gilbert Street space. Um, if you kind of look backwards, you see that, um, oh wait, there's a $33,000 deficit, and if you keep looking backwards for four or five years, those deficits are there. Um, we needed these last two years to be able to make the kind of strides that we're prepared to make over the next three years. You'll also see on that page five that we're almost doubling wages and benefits in the current fiscal year that just started, almost doubling artistic costs, um, artistic stipends to artists, um, production costs on the artistic world, and our patron services were doubling too. We want to make this a welcoming space. We want to make it a... a a kind of beacon of professional theater um, in a town that um, I can't think of another city this size that can support a theater like Riverside. Um, we're finally in a place to um, really um, make leaps uh, and to grow. And to do that, um, you know, we're asking for continued city support. Thank you, Adam. Questions, comments from counselors? Uh, well, I would just say again, it's been kind of interesting hearing from all of you in terms of haven't heard yet from John, but uh, <laughs> the uh, that you know we, I think all of us in one way or another, and certainly our cultural institutions went through a kind of a stress test here, and came through it um, with I think uh, a, you know a more a sort of broader vision and yet more resources to bring to the community. So it's. It's sort of a testament to, as you were saying, the the resilience of these institutions, and um, that's very promising. You know that <laughs> that you know we we made it through, and it with with optimism. So um, you know, and certainly with your new theater, um, I mean that's and the expansion of your programming. I mean that's astonishing. Um, to go was a hundred to one hundred and fifty events. Right. I mean, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I'm happy to give my support. All right. Thank you. We'll move on to last Thank but you. not least, UNESCO yeah. City of Literature. John, you're welcome. welcome. Hello to everyone. As my predecessors up here have said, it's wonderful to just be in the same room <laughs> with everyone and be able to see you and speak with you. Um, in the interest of time, I won't belabor the point. We all know there was a pandemic, and we know it was not good for the arts, as we all have said. 
Um, so I just wanted to uh, highlight a few things um, that I guess we've learned or things that we have done as an organization that have come out of that. Um, like most of the folks here, we moved all of our programming to virtual over the past 18 months, and it was just last week when we had uh, this year's iteration of the Iowa City Book Festival that we moved toward hybrid programming where we had some things in person. Uh, but during that 18 month span, when we were doing things virtually, uh, we've learned some things that I think will help us as an organization moving forward. Um, one thing, uh, again, echoing some of these comments, is just the reach when we do things virtually, when we look at new ways to provide programming, we found that we were reaching different people in our community that hadn't participated in our events in the past, um, beyond our community, and not just regionally, but um, internationally. We were finding that we had people participating. And I'm not so naive as to think that we're going to keep that international audience of that same scope, but we can keep some of them and we can learn from some of the things that we did. Um, more specifically, what we learned about was accessibility for our programming. You know, in the past, we would have a, a reading, we would tape it, we'd get it up on YouTube in the next couple of weeks, we'd put out something on social media. Um, but what we realized is that people weren't able to fully participate in these events the way they could if they were in the space. And so just by all of us learning how to use Zoom and all of these different tools and, and realizing that we can stream our events live and take pains to make sure that people were able to participate virtually in the same way they would if they were in the room, we made everything that we did that much more accessible. And as an example, the book festival that we just had, we would have 20 or 30 people in the room listening to a reading. We'd have 20 or 30 people on Zoom. And uh, the folks moderating, myself included, made sure that people who were asking questions from any of those, or either of those audiences rather, we could blend them all in together so that people who couldn't normally come to our events would be able to participate. And we've realized that, you know, we'll do that moving forward because that was a lesson that we've learned. It's not as difficult as we perhaps thought it was. It's not as costly as we thought it was. Um, and so we're able to do that. And so that really has built into our mission is in trying to make what we do as accessible to as many people as possible, um, we'll be able to do that going forward. And the other thing, and I'm glad I have my colleagues here in the room, is we did uh, even more collaboration than normal. We're a very collaborative organization, in part because we don't have our own space. So, you know, I don't have my own theater. Um, luckily, I know a lot of guys who do. <laughs> and so we do a lot of events there. We do a lot of events, obviously, with the Iowa City Public Library and other spaces, but um, we, collaborated a lot more because we all needed help amplifying our messages. And, and one thing I can't believe is the fourth guy to speak, I get to talk about this, but you know, we have the Iowa City Downtown Arts Alliance uh, that we had started before the pandemic hit, but uh, it really ramped up in terms of what we were doing in terms of trying to support one another, look for collaborative opportunities, a lot of information sharing. Um, and so we were able to do that as well. And I think that will continue. Those relationships that we've built over the last year and a half have gotten uh, considerably stronger and I think will only yield uh, great things going forward. Um, a couple of things that we did um, programmatically uh, in terms of doing uh, virtual programming, or actually I'll just focus it on one, was a community reading program that we've done and it's had many different iterations over the last 18 months. Uh, but we've worked with Anna Barker, who is a local professor here at the university and is a member of our board, on doing these community reading programs where we tackle these massive doorstop books that most people have read 30 pages in, put a bookmark, and then put it back on the shelf after giving up. Uh, we're currently in the midst of Brothers Karamazov right now, and there's tons of uh, ancillary programming, including the Grand Inquisitor that Adam had mentioned that uh, is uh, in partnership with our organization and the book festival. Um, but again, that's something that hundreds of people from all over the world, but mostly in our community, are taking part in this and finding a way to create community that wasn't there before. And that has been really instructive for us as well. Um, at the same time, because we haven't been having in-person events, we haven't had the same opportunities for um, sponsorships or contributions that come from people who come through the doors of whatever we happen to be doing. Um, luckily for us, the costs of our events has gone down at a commensurate level because I'm not 
flying authors in. I'm not putting them up in hotels. And so uh, we've been able to sustain. But like uh, my colleagues here, as we look toward a future where we hopefully can do things more in person, we are looking to see those costs ramp up again and uh, take advantage of some of those opportunities with uh, the new audiences that we've reached out to. Um, and the last thing I just wanted to mention is during the pandemic, we did go through a strategic planning process as well and looked at addressing a lot of the different things that we've talked about in terms of expanding our programming and look at the accessibility of the programming, uh, the um, um, representation in our programming, and uh, as well as just being more efficient and more effective in that. And there's a lot of details in the document that I sent to Wendy that you uh, have access to. And then lastly, um, I have taken on a role as the coordinator for the cities of literature. So, you know, we are UNESCO designated city of literature. We're now one of 39 around the around the world, rather, uh, still one of only two here in the U.S. Uh, but I am coordinating all of those folks now. And so while that has meant uh, a lot more emails that show up in my inbox from Europe as soon as I wake up every morning, it also means that we have an opportunity to have more uh, effective um, collaborations and communications with their other cities and the other members of the network, which can only help to raise our profile and to make people more aware of what we're doing here. And I've certainly been trying to take advantage of that. So I think I'll stop there and see if you have any questions. Questions? You said how many cities in the United States of literature, Iowa and... Uh, yeah. Seattle is the other in, in the, the United States. Seattle, yeah. that was Great. And I will say, uh, at the end of this week, we are anticipating the next round of cities. We go through a process every two years where cities uh, apply for the designation and are evaluated, and UNESCO typically names those at the end of October. So we could see another five or six cities probably named uh, soon. So our network will continue to grow and that many more opportunities for collaboration. And travel. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> All right. Well, before we finish this out and, and vote on this, and I think I know where we're headed, um, I would just like to thank all of you, um, not just for showing up today, but for what you do every day and every night, and for what you've done, um, not just over the last 18 months or so, but we wouldn't, we wouldn't, you wouldn't, your organizations would not be coming out this side of the pandemic as strong as you are if it wasn't for the effort of you and your predecessors, um, you know, for the years prior to that. And you positioned yourself and your organizations in a way that you were prepared to deal with just totally unexpected circumstances and trying to figure out kind of on the fly at that point, you know, how are you gonna survive from some places more or less having to shut down like film scene uh, versus Riverside, who said, no, we're going to figure out a way to keep going, and we're basically going to do all this pretty much virtually and do it, you know, in the safest way, you know, that we can. So it was different for all of you, but it just speaks, it just speaks phenomenally to, to your passion, to your knowledge, to your hard work, to your character, uh, to your caring about the arts, and, and the additional collaboration that you have developed over these last 18 months. Um, will only make our art scene, you know, that much stronger as we go forward. So all I can say is thank you very, very much. Appreciate it. So. I, I will echo what Susan said, but, you know, this is, I know also like 2020 has been really uh, a bad hit in every organize the art organizations and you might, yeah, from the loss that you have also you can tell. Uh, but I think you are providing very, like, amazing thing for our residents in Iowa City. And uh, our people really enjoy what you guys doing. And that's why we wanna make sure you are there and you are existing, you are doing this and continue the good work that you have. I will be supportive for all of them. Yeah, I too would certainly, it's been, it's fun hearing about how you all have worked through the challenges of the last year and a half and John, you're talking about access that just reminded me that, you know, I'm, I just turned 70 this year and I know many people my age are older. Access is a huge issue in terms of um, experiencing the arts. And so I think, I think the pandemic had that 
aspect to it as well is that um, I think it revealed the fact of how many people are challenged in terms of being able to see live performances uh, regardless of whether there's a pandemic. Right. Uh, so yeah, I, I do hope that we, you know, we, we've all learned from this experience and I think evolved to some degree in, in terms of understanding that, you know, our audience is out there. How do we, how do we access them? How do we make that connection and maybe through creativity in terms of venue, whether it's in person or virtual. Um, but certainly, I, you know, I'm very appreciative of all the work that you've done over the last year and uh, look forward to the coming year and the work that you'll be doing. And I think it's a challenge for all of us too, to, to find ways to help you um, to increase and diversify your audience. And I, I know you're all working hard at it. Um, you know, you can only give away so many free tickets. Um, you know, you have to sell tickets to help, you know, reach that bottom line that you need to reach. But I think there's also, and, and I would count myself in this category, a person who did not grow up with the arts per se. Um, you know, I grew up on a dairy farm in Vermont. It's about as far away from the theater as you can get, you know. Um, and so, you know, and, Ended up in college and, and my choice of major was engineering. Again, about as far away from the arts as you get. And so there's a lot of people who don't have that natural connection, you know, based on their, you know, their lifelong experiences. Yet once they get into those places, okay, they see something that they really connect to, they really enjoy, they say, hey, this is a lot of fun. We, you know, we need to make an effort to go back. And at the same time, this is where I found myself a lot over the years, is life gets in the way. And we don't, you know, we don't make enough of an effort to make that a priority. And so to push people like myself and others to say, wait a minute, this is a really valuable experience. This is good for you mentally, emotionally, you know, make it a priority in your life to get involved in these organizations or go see some of these movies, performances, whatever. And so, you know, I just challenge all of us to try and find ways to extend that thinking and whether it's a personal invitation to a friend to go to a show or whatever to help you. Um, and, and I think that's especially important uh, for people who don't feel comfortable going. Um, either it's because I don't know anything about the theater, I would feel mm -hmm. kind of foolish going in there, or I'm a person of color and there's hardly any other people of color here, or I'm a low-income person, and this is only for the rich people in the community. You know, all those different things. Um, so I think for any and all of us who can help you find ways to reach into those areas of the community and, and kind of spread that network that more people can invite other people just enriches all of our community. But in the meantime, thank you. Thank you so much for what you've done and continue to do. Yes, so. thank you. And just we, as I said, we want like the whole community to benefit out of the good work that you have. Just give up the good work and try to reach out as many people as you can. Yeah, thank you. All right. Do we have a motion to approve recommending all of these amounts? I think they're in our packet, so I won't read through them. But I will be happy to move that. Yeah. I'll be happy to second that. <laughs> all those in favor say aye. 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 And it passes three to zero. Thank you again so very much. Thank you so much for the support. <clears throat> okay, I think we are to staff reports, if I'm correct. Yeah. Thanks, everybody, for coming, first yes. of all. We'll talk to you soon. <clears throat> um, I just had three things. Um, one, to bring to your attention, um, next week, the uh, petition for a South District uh, Self-Supporting Municipal Improvement District will be going to PNZ. And um, I look for them to um, uh, review the, the petition for merit and feasibility. And if they agree that it has sound merit and feasibility, then they will forward that on to you. Um, and then that will come to council first to set a public hearing and then to enact the SMID would require an ordinance that would, that would happen later. So that's out there on the radar coming up in the next several weeks. So. I'm sorry, Wendy, would that come to Economic Development Committee or just straight to the council? Straight straight okay. to PNZ and then council. Okay, that's yeah. right. 
Um, and then just to report on a couple of other things. Um, over the last several months, we had, uh, as you know, we had established um, the Industrial Energy Efficiency Grant Program, and we had uh, about 10 applications. We funded six or seven, <laughs> sorry, I should have had those numbers all added up, for a total of $748,000 on energy improvement projects um, at everywhere from Procter & Gamble, Earl May, Iowa City Storage, United Natural Foods Incorporated, Reunion Brewery, Old Capital Tofu, Alpla, and Adamantine Moving. So um, we've, we are helping to make a big impact on uh, energy efficiency at those industrial businesses. N and knowing how much of the community's carbon footprint uh, they're responsible for, I, I think you should be very proud that this has uh, proceeded as it has. We're also getting ready to roll out <clears throat> a very similar program for um, the area that, most of the area that is included in the downtown Riverfront Crossings and uh, Northside Marketplace, where grants will be offered for energy efficiency projects. Uh, minimum grant would be uh, would be $20,000. They're 50-50 grants, so the project size has to be substantial at 40,000. The maximum grant size would be 100,000. Of course, that would require a $200,000 project. Um, we will be rolling this out over the next several weeks or so, um, and we'll start off by offering 10 grants. We're just not sure what sort of interest we're gonna have in that, and we wanted to uh, limit the amount of administrative time that would be uh, required to handle that by um, starting small. We may open it up again after that, but we'll start with 10. Uh, and then lastly, the thing, only other thing I had was that our office, off, uh, our office also um, uh, conducted the Climate Action at Work Awards through our business community, and we awarded, and I'm sure you saw this during the Climate Fest, Fest week, uh, but we uh, awarded ACT for uh, adaptation. We awarded the new gas station out on uh, uh, Dodge Street uh, in the interstate, Urban Fuel Express for, for its building, for taking action in buildings. We awarded Bicycle Happiness in the Transportation category, a Haunted Bookshop for Waste Management, and New Pioneer for um, Supporting Sustainable Lifestyles. So we've been busy in economic development across a range of different kinds of projects with a lot of focus on energy efficiency. This past almost year since we've met before. Yeah, it's been a while. And that's all I had. I don't know if the other staff. Okay, anything from the committee? I'll just say, I'm assuming this is my last Economic Development Committee meeting. I'm assuming we probably won't have another one <laughs> before the end of the year. We're going to have a flurry year. of them it's, in the next Yeah, we're going to have a flurry <laughs> since we haven't done this in 10 months. Um, so it's been, I don't even know how many years I've done this. It's been quite a few. Um, it's been fun. We get to see a lot of um, interesting new projects uh, before they go to council. And so it's always fun to to kind of get that first view and get that first vetting of a lot of things. And these meetings are some of the best. I mean, the folks that are doing a lot of this arts work um, are really what make this community what it is. So these are a lot of fun. So it's been good. Uh, take motion to adjourn. Before that, I oh. just want to say also, this is my last one, but no, I'm sorry. I'm glad that we have John. So we have at least one person with <laughs> experience. One when you created here. your new, you know, oh, at least you're going to come back again. Hopefully. Yeah, we kind of did that when Rockney yes. and Jim left too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was the so, one. So yeah. uh, we have like somebody who was really have experience to start us off on this. And uh, yeah, I enjoyed it. I was really hoping to be on this committee now, and I, I did. And yeah, yes. Good to know all this stuff. So, you know, like, uh, have knowledge on a lot of things throughout this committee and what is coming to this committee normally. So, yeah, I'm very happy being here. And well, this was a nice meeting to have as your last meeting because yeah. it, it really had a. Yes. It's very, very, very warm upbeat. and uh -huh. good feelings. Yeah. 
associated with this one. Yeah. Very well, it always says a lot to me that, uh, you know, we view arts and culture in economic development. And, and mm -hmm. that's not the norm. Uh, and most cities don't view it. They may fund it, but they don't view it as economic development. And clearly that's a major strategy of, of ours and has been for, for quite some time. Uh, Maz and Susan, thank you for your service on this, on this commission. Um, uh, we have seen a lot of projects uh, come through, although it's been a slower year. Um, you know, your, your fingerprints are on uh, a lot of the projects. I think just, you know, the one we heard about today, the Tailwinds project, and, you know, that was two, three years in the making that probably came back to this meeting several times. And, um, you know, I, as I talked to folks about that project, I, you know, we've got the awesome story from Riverside Theater. Um, we just bought eight duplexes in the South District with money from mm -hmm. that project. Um, the, you know, you guys all helped shape those policies that led to these cultural venues, led to the affordable housing being required in TIF, and, and now we're seeing some of those first few projects pay dividends. So you should be really proud of the work you did in, in steering not only that individual project, but all of our TIF projects. Well, as we know, before it ever gets to us, the staff does a whole lot of work. <laughs> of course, yeah. <laughs> and gets it, gets it formed yeah, up for you. Us, so. yeah. Okay, do we have a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. Second. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 We are adjourned. Thank you very much. Thank Thanks you. Thank you, everybody.